As much as it pains me to say this, many of you are probably not going to get to experience the joy of writing an interrupt. So why are we doing this? Many years ago when I worked out in industry, we had a system where there was a central station and there were lots of peripherals that you had to communicate with. Now, the designers of the central system, they were having a problem because each one of the peripheral devices, whenever they were sending messages in, well, we need to catch, we needed to catch each one of those messages. And some of them were getting dropped. Some of them were getting missed. And we couldn't figure out why until we looked at their software. And the problem was, was that they were using something called Polled I.O. Now, a couple of lessons ago, we talked about Polled I.O. and what the problem with Polled I.O. was. It was that the processor has to check to see if an I.O. device has something to send it and check and check and check. And in fact, that checking takes time away from what the CPU could be doing. And in fact, whenever you have lots of interfaces to lots of devices out there, the CPU is having to go check, 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 and then check, check, check in a round robin fashion. And you know what? That takes time, and sometimes when a message comes in, perhaps right after that I.O. card had been polled, by the time we get back around to it, the buffer that captured that message got full, had to trash, uh, had to trash a relevant message. So, the whole solution was go to interrupts. And knowing how these interrupts work, and what is required to get them to be set up, and what potentially could be bugs that are introduced by having an asynchronous call to an interrupt service routine. These are all really good things to know whenever you're working with a computing system. So what we're going to talk about now is how to set up an interrupt. Now, first of all, we talked a little bit earlier whenever we were talking about pipeline, about pipelining, about the execution of an instruction. And we talked about the simple stages that are required in terms of executing an instruction. First, you fetch the instruction from memory, then you decode the instruction to figure out what to do with it, and then you execute it. Now, what we didn't put in here is that there's a tiny step, so small that you don't actually need to see it as part of the stages of the execution of an instruction. What you do at the very end here is you check for interrupts. And this is done by the hardware. It's really done in parallel or almost behind the scenes as your code is being executed. What happens if an interrupt occurred? Well, we do something called switching context. Basically what it means is we save the state of the processor's tax, tasks. So save the, the state of the current task. All right. Now, how did we do that? Well, we talked about that in the last lesson. We saved the registers. You know, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of commonality between different architectures. Some architectures do some things one way, another way, another architecture may do things another way. In some cases, some interrupts cause only a couple of key things to be saved. For example, the instruction pointer or the program counter and the flags. Um, and, and other, other architectures will just go ahead and save everything for you. Other architectures onto the stack, other architectures may switch to a set of shadow registers. So there are all sorts of ways, but the key is, is we need to make sure that we, when, when we come back to our executed code, we pick up exactly where we left off. So how do we set these things up? Well, let me make a little bit of room before I put together how we set up an interrupt. All right, I'm going to draw what kind of looks a little bit like a memory map. You've seen memory maps in our discussions or our lessons before, but let's do something that shows a little bit about how interrupts are set up. Now, a portion of memory is going to be reserved for a table used by the hardware to find 
the interrupt service routine. Remember that the interrupt service routine, that is a, a method or a function that is called by hardware. It's not called by your software. It's called by your hardware in order to process this I.O. And in fact, something that's most common whenever it comes to an interrupt service routine is that it's the I.O. device has something to, to a large amount of data to pass. Let's say it's a network interface card. Maybe it's received a large message. And so it calls it. It, it uses hardware to interrupt the processor so that the interrupt service routine that is associated with that network interface card is called and a large chunk of data is transferred from the network interface card to memory to keep it safe so that the next message can come in. Happens the other way around too. It may be that the interrupt service routine is called by the network interface card to say, hey, I've got an empty buffer. Do you need to send something? And the hardware or the in your code was actually saying, hey, I have this message to send. When you've got room, could you send this message? The interrupt service routine then says, oh, he's got room. Let's move that over. Now, the other thing that we need, of course, is somewhere in memory, is we need our interrupt service routine. We're going to talk a lot about that in this lesson. But it turns out that there is also a portion of code typically run just once, and so maybe this is part of the operating system, maybe it's part of your code, who knows, but there is a little portion of this code which sets up the interrupt. And there are a couple of things that happen here. All right, so three things that we really need to concentrate on whenever it comes to this. Now, the first thing that we're going to talk about is the interrupt service routine itself. So what does the ISR need to do? Well, the very first thing that we need to talk about is the format of this interrupt service routine. You cannot pass any parameters because remember, the parameters are passed to a function by, you know, for example, if I had multiply and then in parentheses A and B, those two values that I want to multiply together. I can't pass any parameters to an interrupt service routine because it's not being called by software, it's being called by hardware. The hardware doesn't have any parameters to pass. All the parameters, it it passes are really defined by which interrupt occurred, the IRQ that occurred in order to call this interrupt service routine. So there are no passed parameters. There is also no return value. Why is there no return value? Well, where is the return value going to go? The return value is usually handled by the software that called the interrupt service routine. Since it's hardware that's calling it, there's no return value. Now, typically, as I said, and this is not always the case, but typically it involves a block transfer of data. All right. And so, once again, maybe a message coming in from a network interface card, maybe it's a big graphics card that wants to have data in order to be output to the screen, it's available to be output. Maybe it's something like a bus error and, and we've got to figure out how to alert the operating system that there's been a problem transferring data between the processor or the cache and main memory. All right. Now, Another thing, though, that we need to do is we need to check something called the interrupt flags. Now, the interrupt flags actually serve a couple of purposes. Um, first of all, the interrupt flags actually tell us that an interrupt has occurred. So it's a special, it's a, it's a register in memory. It's an addressable memory location that whenever you go out to it, it has ones and zeros for different interrupts. So it may be, and this is just going to be a simple 8-bit register flag. So it may be that we have IRQ. 7, IRQ 8, whoop, not 8, 6, IRQ 6, IRQ 5, IRQ 4, IRQ 3, IRQ 2, IRQ 1, 
and IRQ0. All right. Now, what may happen is, and, and, and understand this is really important because the number of hardware interrupts or IRQs that are available to us, an IRQ, an interrupt request, these are signals coming from the hardware to identify the source of what interrupt happened. Whenever I get an interrupt, one of the first things I do is I check this interrupt, this, this interrupt flags. Um, and so the one pattern of ones and zeros show me which interrupts are requesting service. Now, the fact that there's a one in one of these serves a couple of purposes. It tells us the source, what to start looking for. And so maybe this IRQ uh, is associated with the network interface card. Maybe this IRQ is associated with uh, a bus error. Um, and so whenever I look at these flags, I see which interrupts are active and which interrupts it's possible that, that, that activated this interrupt service routine. Note also that it may be that each one of these flags is associated with a different interrupt service routine. So it is possible that one interrupt service routine is called by our, our IRQ6, one is by IRQ4, and so forth. But it's also possible that I just have one ISR to find out or to handle all of those flags. So the first thing we do is we check the interrupt flags to see what needs service. All right. The second thing though is that a one in one of those positions actually causes the interrupt to occur. So if I come down here and I start executing my interrupt service routine, I finish, I go back to the process, but I haven't cleared that flag, the interrupt's gonna get called again. And in fact, what'll happen is I'll jump back to my code, won't execute any instructions, come right back to the interrupt service routine. Try to handle it because I didn't clear it. So the second thing I need to do when it comes to checking the interrupt flags is I need to clear, sometimes referred to as acknowledging, so acknowledge the interrupt, all right? And that sometimes is as simple as, let's just clear the flag, all right? And that means that that particular interrupt is not going to call us again. So we need to check the interrupt flags. Then, like I said, we'll do some sort of a, of, a, of a block transfer of the data or handle the interrupt. And then we need to restore the context. We need to put things back the way they were whenever we were, whenever we were interrupting that task. We need to put things back. We need to reset, put the instruction pointer, the program counter, the flags, the stack pointer, all registers that we modify, we need to put everything back the way it was so we can carry on with the task that we interrupted. All right, that's a little bit about the interrupt service routine itself. Now, let's talk about setting up the interrupt. Actually, let's take a step back. Let's talk about this table. Software. Pretty easy to call a function, right? You just simply call the function. Uh, how do you call an interrupt service routine using hardware? Well, it all starts with something called an interrupt vector. Now, an interrupt vector is nothing more than the address of the ISR. All right. Now, for the hardware, and remember, we don't have to pass any parameters to it. We don't get any uh, returned values. So all the hardware needs in order to call the interrupt service routine is its address. And depending on what system you're working with, this address may involve a couple of components, but really what we're looking for is the address of the interrupt service routine. So the hardware, all it needs in order to access the interrupt service routine is the interrupt vector. So. There's two ways we can do this, but both ways involve creating a table. All right. Now, associated with each row of the table might be which interrupt request goes to which line of the table. 
So we just have a, you know, for example, IRQ0, call this is associated with this first element of the table, IRQ1, next element of the table, IRQ2, next element of the table. Now, one of the simplest ways that we can implement this table is something called an interrupt vector table. Okay, an IVT. All right. And that just simply means that you put the address of each one of the interrupt service routines into each entry in the table. And so let's say that I have a 32-bit memory space. In other words, I have 32 address lines for each one of the memory locations. So all I need to do when an interrupt occurs, in order to call the interrupt service routine, I just need to take that 32-bit address where my interrupt service routine is located and store that address. And let's just go ahead and make this clear. So these are, we are storing addresses in each one of those positions. So the interrupt occurs, end of an instruction. We check for interrupts. We notice that, that IRQ1 is a one. We've got a flag set in that interrupt flag. We simply go take this interrupt service routine's address, load it into the program counter after storing context, of course, load that address into the program counter or instruction pointer, guess what the next address is that we execute? It's our interrupt service routine, all right? So this is one of the first ways that we can find the interrupt service routine when an, when an interrupt has occurred. But there's a second way, which is similar, but has a slightly different way of operating. Now the second way, we also have a table, right? But this one is called an interrupt jump table. And so once again, each one of our interrupts has a different entry in our table, but instead of the entry containing an address, it actually contains a single instruction, more than likely a jump instruction. And so it'll go jump, so we'll have some sort of, probably a JMP or a BRA for branch. So jump ISR0. And then the next one is jump ISR1. And then jump ISR2. And so forth. Now, this one operates slightly different. An interrupt occurs, and instead of taking an address and loading it into the program counter that corresponds to the beginning of the interrupt service routine, instead, you just simply load the address of that position in the jump table, you load that into the program counter, and the next instruction to be executed is this instruction, and it automatically jumps there, all right? And so in this case, it's just really easy to, well, you know, you're automatically executing code. You know exactly which instruction is going to be executed next whenever one of these interrupts occurs. It's one pointing to each one of these items in the table, each one of these entries in the table. So there's two ways of actually having the hardware get to the interrupt service routine. I said that there was a third thing, right? The third thing is, actually setting up this interrupt. Now let's talk about one piece of code that gets executed exactly once whenever you set up the interrupt. You know, we've got the interrupt service routine. That's code that gets called by the hardware. We've got the interrupt jump table or the interrupt vector table. That makes it so that the hardware can find the interrupt service routine. But we actually have to set things up so that the interrupt can occur at all. And this is done in some code that sets up the interrupt. So setting up the interrupt. There are a couple of things that this setup code is doing. The first thing it needs to do is it needs to initialize the interrupt jump table. So the interrupt jump table or the interrupt vector table. It needs to make sure that the appropriate address of that interrupt service routine has been loaded properly, either as an instruction, a jump instruction, 
or as a vector in the interrupt vector table, as an address in the interrupt vector table. So it needs to set up the table. The second thing it needs to do is it needs to uh, work to initialize the I.O. device. So, whatever parameters need to be assigned inside the I.O. device in order to make it so it works properly, you got to have code that sets that up. Remember when we talked in the previous lesson, in one of the previous lessons, about setting up the timers. We had four timers, or actually we had one timer inside of the Raspberry Pi, but we had four compare registers. Well, a simple idea of what, or a simple example of what working to initialize the I.O. device might be, is we need to set up each one of those compare registers so that they will watch for the correct value of our free running timer and be able to interrupt us at appropriate time. All right. Third, we need to locally enable the interrupt. We talked about these, these, ma these maskable interrupts, these interrupts that you could turn on and off. Well, typically what happens is you have a register that has little enable bits. So, you know, this may be, once again, we'll do IRQ0, IRQ1, IRQ2, and so forth. And if there's a zero in one of those positions, that means that that particular, enable, that particular interrupt is not locally enabled. It's not, it's, if it occurs, we're not going to acknowledge it. It's gonna be as if it never happened. We didn't hear it. The phone rang and we didn't answer it. But a one in that position would say that that particular interrupt has locally been enabled. All right, so I can turn on and off interrupts. And in fact, when the processor first comes up, you don't want these interrupts to be triggering and jumping and going to the interrupt jump table or the interrupt vector table, not finding an, uh, finding an appropriate address and instead just kind of jumping anywhere. You know, if there's a random pattern of ones and zeros in the interrupt vector table and we have an interrupt occur, but we haven't prepared for it, it's going to jump to who knows where. So we need to have control with these locally enable, uh, these flags, in order to make sure that we can turn these things on and off. This is done in a, in a register called the interrupt mask. All right. So we have the interrupt flags, which tells us if an interrupt has occurred. We have the interrupt mask to say if an interrupt is enabled. We also have to globally enable interrupts. All right. Now, this means that I can actually turn on all of my interrupts, maskable interrupts, or turn off all my inter interrupts globally. And sometimes this is nice because think about this. If I have been interrupted, it is possible to be interrupted again inside of that interrupt. So I could have an interrupt which then interrupts me inside of an interrupt, which inside interrupts me inside of another interrupt, and I can have these nested interrupts. Sometimes you don't want that to happen. In fact, often you don't want that to happen. And so typically what we can do is we can globally disable the interrupts so that they stop happening while I'm in an interrupt. All right. Now, how's that done? Well, do you remember our flags register? We had this register, and, and I'm not going to make all of them, but if you remember, we have this register which had all these flags. There was like the zero flag, the sign flag, the carry flag, the parity flag, the auxiliary carry flag, uh, the overflow flag, and so forth. There were a bunch of them. Well, there's also flags in this register that allow us to control the operation of the processor. And so you might have a flag called something like IE that is your interrupt enable flag. So instead of using these as reading flags where we read it to see the state of the processor, we can actually control our operation by putting a one or a zero there in order to globally enable these interrupts. All right. 
So that'll give you a brief introduction. It doesn't seem brief, but that's a brief introduction into how we're going to set up our interrupts. It includes three things, the interrupt jump table, the interrupt vector table, one of those two, you know, the tables. It includes setting up the code in our in our main code to, to actually make it so that the interrupt can occur. And it also includes that ever important interrupt service routine. We'll give you some examples about how to do this once again using our Raspberry Pi in the next episode.